Hello, I'm Mark Tucker. Hey, I'm Alan Furstenberg. We are Two Voice Devs. Two Voice Devs. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Doing fine. I think we could call this our Two Voice Devs OpenAI Announcements Edition. Yes, definitely. I, you know, this is, we are, uh, to, to put some context in this, we are recording this the Wednesday after OpenAI Dev Day on Monday. And I'm going to be trying to get this out and available to everyone by the end of the week. So this is this is a fast paced uh, episode with a lot of stuff to it. Yes, and, that, yeah, definitely lots to go over. Um, some stuff that that's kind of near dear to our hearts with voice technology. They you know start cover some stuff with uh, text to speech. So should we just start getting going? I said we just there? let's dive in. Let's get right to this. Um, so. And this, the, these these first ones, they were announced, but they weren't really big and hyped and played up. But I think we should call them out because they are so directly tied to the stuff we've been talking about for two and a half years. Yes, exactly. So um, similar to what you can do with uh, with Polly or other um, voices, um, OpenAI has a, a new text-to-speech model that provides... Uh, Output six uh, voices to choose from. They sounded uh, the 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 demo that they had uh, voice sounded really uh, realistic um, and lifelike. They even showed some some demos of how it could be used in a voice assistant with voice input and text to speech output. Yep, and we'll get to some of that in a minute. I uh, in a in a bit, I think. Um, the audio was good. What was interesting to me um, was that they they advertise it at two quality levels either the high quality level or a lower and faster quality that they warn may have some static. And I found that interesting. I'm like, static? What, what does that even mean? Yeah. Um, so that was interesting. Looking at the pricing, the price is comparable to, certainly I, I went and priced it against Google and uh, the price is comparable to Google's um, text-to-speech models. Again, when comparing the higher quality versus the lower quality for each. So, uh, you know, I didn't go and compare it against Polly or any of the others. Um, so that was interesting. So six voices. One of the things I didn't hear about is, are these voices just English voices? How well do they perform with non-English text? Right. And something else I didn't hear was SSNL support. I did not hear that, so I went and looked it up. No SSML support. All right. They were they they didn't say that in the documentation, but the documentation has a frequently asked question, and one of them is like, "How can I change the 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 I forget if they you know the tone or the the whatever?" And they said, "You can't." We've experimented with doing things like changing punctuation and changing capitalization, and sometimes that works, but not very well. Okay, so it's it's not uh, not as fine tuned as as uh, some of the other voice models that are available, but maybe uh, it's uh, different it, different purpose, maybe different purpose. Um, I think what it is definitely saying is that it's not uh, it's not aiming it at people who are willing to use SSML or who want to have yeah. that kind of control. It's just you want text to speech. Here's text to speech. We do a really good job. Most of the time. <laughs> um, so I think it will start, we, we will start to see things like, well, okay, how does it, how does it handle pronouncing words? Is it going to mess up in some cases? And yeah, how do we fix that if it does? So that'll, that'll be interesting. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I did write down the exact quote. There's no direct mechanism to control the emotional output of the audio generated. Certain factors may influence the output audio, like capitalization or grammar, but our internal tests with these have yielded mixed results. It's meant as a, you get what you get. There's one other thing though that it does that I found, or that the documentation says it does, that I found really interesting that I don't think any of the other current uh, text-to-speech models do, and that's that it can do streaming audio. Oh, that is interesting. So. So I kind of wonder if it can also do streaming input. So if you get your streaming input from your LLM that is streaming tokens to it, and it is taking these tokens and streaming the output, 
you're getting a lot faster response right than what we're what we've been used to that can go a long way to cutting down the the trivial response time yeah yeah which so, which as we've discussed is so crucial yeah that's correct so what you basically talked about on the voice input was the uh, was whisper and the, the new uh, whisper 3 model right so in terms of voice input um the whisper 2 model is considered a great model uh, one of the things they did about Whisper 2 that they're not really doing with any of their other models is it's an open model. So the, the model is available. Anybody can run it locally. Um, Whisper 3 will also be an open model. Uh, I say will be because I, I'm not sure if the model itself has been released, but it's certainly not available yet through their API. So uh, it's there. I've heard people are doing interesting things about it. I haven't looked at it too much myself. Have you looked at it much yet? No, no, not yet. Okay, so Whisper three is either there or coming, but uh, not doesn't seem that that major over Whisper two. So those were the the cool voice elements right. to this. And uh, there's actually one other thing that I think is is very voice related, or yeah, that we'll talk about later. Um, but the kind of the, the core, the big core of their announcement was what they were calling GPT-4 Turbo. And this is a model that uh, right now is in beta test. It's, you know, it's available, but it's not the production, it's not considered production level yet. Right. But it offers some better things. The, um, the most important of which, at least from everyone I've been talking to is it's cheaper. Yeah. The, the per token price is, you know, somewhere between half and a third of the right. price of the per token price of GPT-4 today. And it's still more expensive than GPT-3.5 Turbo, but it's cheap, but it's, 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 uh, you know, it's slightly better than what it was before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, enough that it's noticeable, but not enough that people who are already spending thousands will want to switch to it yeah and uh and the the token limit or the context window is like 128k uh tokens yeah 128k context window one of the things that he also said that not a lot of people have been picking up on is he said the model is also better tuned to handle the middle portion of that context window because that's been a criticism recently yeah. is that a lot of models are really good at using stuff in the beginning and end but not the middle he claimed it was better at the middle. Um, I'm seeing some mixed results on that, so I don't know. But 128k context window is it's ma you know it's massive. It's truly massive. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting though is although it's called Turbo, there's not a lot of performance improvements on it yet. Yeah, and that's and that's kind of the other big thing that we talked about when when using these things and in, in type of voice assistant is that just how long of a latency there is in responses, um, and you know they talked about that they they could focus on price or they could focus on performance and they decided to focus for some price and that you know that that might be spin or that might be reality. <laughs> um, you know there might be some technical issues that they're hitting right now or some things they're trying to solve on performance that's just not quite there yet. Well, one of the things that I've noticed with other models is that when you increase the context window, even if you just send the same amount of tokens to, to one that has say a 4, 4K window and one that has a 32K window, the 32K one will be slower, even if you're sending it the exact same input. Yeah. So maybe they did get some performance improvements but those were all eaten up by the fact that they increased the context window. Yeah. That's possible. I don't know. Um, but it's it's interesting. It's a good question. You know, one of the things that people really liked about the open AI models were uh the the ability to have it generate and respond to functions, right? Right. Um, so one of the interesting features that they announced with this one are what they call multiple function responses. So this is like you know with uh with google you used to be able to say something like um turn the light on and uh change the volume to four yeah you know two two instructions that were kind of grouped in there you couldn't do that previously with uh the gpt models 
now you can. And, and my understanding is that they execute them in parallel so that, that you get the performance um, improvement there. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, and kind of combined with that is that they have something they now call JSON mode. And yeah, that, that, that reminds ahead. us of our conversation a few weeks ago about uh, t uh, type chat, where yeah. uh, the idea was is that you could write um, your prompt such that you return JSON and that you can validate the JSON. Um, I'm not sure what they do behind the scenes, but that's that's something that's that's big for uh, developers. If, if you don't want something that's just a simple chatbot where you take the output of the chatbot and just return that as the text, um, if you want to use that as data to do other things um, with and then you know format the output the way that you want, um, you know, JSON mode is going to be a big uh, I, th I think there. I think JSON mode is huge. There were two interesting bits to it that I saw, though. Uh, one was that uh, turning function uh, turning function responses on automatically turns on JSON mode. So if you're dealing with functions, you're going to get JSON mode. Uh, the second is you, you kind of need to understand what JSON mode means. It means that it will return, it will guarantee valid JSON. Yeah. That does not necessarily mean that it will guarantee a valid schema for that JSON. Just that whatever JSON you get back, you can put into a parser safely. So something like type chat still becomes essential just to make sure you're getting the schema back that you want to get back. Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to see things go to the next level where you're like, okay, JSON mode's on, but these are the different types that I care about and yep. have that and, more baked into um, right. kind of the, it, the processing as opposed to the prompt. And in some ways, that's what functions do is they do more guarantee a schema because that's what the function is supposed to return. Yeah. But it's still not, not quite there. And yeah, I, I agree with you. I think uh, in terms of AI tools, that's kind of the next step that we, we kind of need as developers. But one thing that I find really interesting is that they're also introducing what they call reproducible outputs. And this is literally something that I've, I've been talking about for a long time saying, you know, how do we test this? What are, what, yeah. you know, when, when your AI can respond in any way, how do you know that the response is going to be the response that you want? Yeah. So they're now introducing something called reproducible outputs, which if you understand how a random number generator works, which is kind of underlying all of this stuff, um, Random number generators, they're really pseudo random number generators. They're, they're not really random. They just look random. They feel yeah. random. But they start out with a number called a seed number. And if you give it the same seed number, it will generate the same sequence of random numbers afterwards. This is how pseudo random number generators have worked for decades. There's nothing new here. Previously, when you would make a call, it would use, you know, whatever is whatever is next in the sequence for some random generation, or it would randomly generate a seed and start with that. This means you can specify that seed so that you have a predictable set of random numbers that come afterwards. So given the same prompt input and the same seed, you are guaranteed the same output. Yeah, I've, I've seen this. It wasn't in this this context of this uh, dev days. Um, and I'm not even sure if I remember if it was uh, related to OpenAI or not. But I saw that just recently with they were talking about um, using a seed um, seed value to get, you know, the same character generated on an image. And you could change various descriptions of it, but by using the same seed value, then there was more consistency on who the character was as opposed to generating a brand new you know person every time or yeah i've seen this a lot in some of the image generators for example yeah. where you know you want to be able to generate things that look more or less the same but you're going to need to come up with a new prompt or you need to modify your prompt but you want the same seed value because it was it was close yeah uh, you don't want it just going off in a total new random direction yeah so uh again for developers, reproducible outputs is huge. And then finally, 
they kind of just said, oh yeah, and we can now deal with image input and output too as part of, uh, it will be part of GPT-4 Turbo. And it's just kind of, you know, yeah, we're doing great. We're doing images too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's, you know, if you, if you played with this with uh, GPT-4 vision in the, in the playground, in the, in chat GPT, or if you've played with Bard, you get how, how powerful this can be. You know, you can, the user can give it, give it an image and ask questions about that image. The image becomes part of the context. Yeah. And that, that opens up the door for all sorts of things on the input side. And then on the output side, you know, combining GPT with Dolly 3, uh, that, that starts getting yeah. some, some really cool looking stuff. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm, I'd like to explore that more because I, I, I played with something um, earlier this, this week about like generating a comic strip mm. um, with, um, with different images and I could see, you know, hopefully this, that functionality would come to, to this uh, open AI stuff as well. That would be kind of a, a cool feature. I feel like I kind of though, and this was something I, I, I posed is, well, okay, it can generate cool pictures. So what, yeah. what, what's, what's the application here? What, you know, where, where does this become useful, important, significant? What's, you know, I'm, I'm starting to wrap my head around uh, text generation and how that's useful. I haven't quite wrapped it around images yet. Um, aside from the fact of, I feel like there's something here. This sure looks cool. Yeah, there's got to be something here, but I, aside from you know generating pictures for my, you know my my presentations, which I've done, yeah, or generating pictures for the book that I'm writing. What's, what's yeah. it doing? You know, and I don't. Yeah, know. I, yeah I see more. Uh, you know, it kind of makes more sense for me on the on the visual input side, um, because you know we've had. I'm not. I'm not sure. I probably. Google has it well with their um, their assistant, but with Alexa, with a screen device, you could hold up something and say, "What is this?" Um, and I can see, you know, now that that ability to to do that um, that type of functionality, open it up to lots of more yes. developers than it was before. Yep. No, and you know, we've seen in the past that people were doing things. You know, people were creating custom AI systems to do things like plant identification. Um, and those were powerful, but that took a lot of training. Now we can do that a lot easier. Well, um, and that's, I think that kind of leads into this next thing because yes. part of the, that, what makes that available is like what documents or images are being indexed to, to then be able to talk about. And, you know, we, those who use chat GPT, um, you know, we're used to typing in a, in a prompt and getting some sort of a response back. And we've talked about vector databases and uh, retrieval augmented generation and all that stuff. And and I think a lot of people that are like dipping their toe in, that's that's what they're doing. They're like, hey, I've got my documents, you know, my website, my you know, book, my whatever it is that their content is. And they're like, hey, let's you know put um, GPT in front of that and be able to you know talk to it or ask questions. So the big announcement. Um, uh, and one that's got I got a you know a lot of buzz um, since the the conference was uh, GPTs and their GPTs are are basically collections of uh, prompts and documents and configuration settings given a name and kind of packaged in into a little uh, an app or yeah a, they're they're or a bot or or whatever you, they call them GPTs but they um they can right now or as this this progresses there'll be you know private internal gpts that you can use yourself there will be public ones that they have hinted at a um some sort of a store where you could monetize um we'll, we'll get to monetization then, in a bit yep we'll, and then there's enterprise ones where you could create them for like an internal use for your own co company documents or or you know things like that so um and uh, they they released a, a you know ten or so 
um, GPTs that were created by OpenAI. That's that's available, you know, now. If you go to you know uh, ChatGPT, then those are the UI has changed a little bit, and those are just available now. And they're hinting at in the future a a tool where you can just easily create your own and package them up and 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 reuse well, them. And the and the tool, I believe, actually, the tool is out now because I've heard of people who are playing with it. Um, um, it's, it wasn't available to me today earlier when I tried, so I don't okay. know if it's limiting, if they're kind of rolling, doing a rollout or exactly when it's going to be available. I've, I've talked to people who have started to play with it and kind of the concept behind the tool is that it's low code or no code, mm -hmm. text driven. So you're in some ways you're having a conversation about creating this conversation tool, um, creative system. And you know, fundamentally, you're you're providing it what they refer to as instructions, which are glorified prompts, right? Um, an expanded knowledge base, which is the retrieval augmented generation part of it, and what they refer to as actions. And you'll be able to write your own actions, you know, so it can do function calls to your APIs as one part of it, for example. But also, they've got some of their own built-in stuff like code interpreter, which is the ability to, to ask it to do something and it will write code to come up with the answer. It will write code and then execute And then run code the code, yes. To then get the answer. Right. So, so there are some of these things that are built in and some of these things that you'll be able to use to expand it yourself. Um, and one of the, you know, they were giving as an example, the ability to, you know, have a conversation with your email or to upload uh, and since it was also tied into GPT for turbo do things like upload your photos and ask questions about your own photos combined with a knowledge base of some other photos or other documents perhaps so uh some very powerful stuff at least being promised yeah uh, there are interesting caveats here, I think, though. And when when I read through this, a bunch of things jumped out at me that that started firing off alarms. So for starters, they talked about how a GPT marketplace would be coming in the near future. And that's all they said about it. Yep. There was no other indication of discovery which those of us coming from the voice world know is a hot button issue. Yeah. Um, they said there will be, will be, without giving any details, there will be revenue sharing in the future, which those of us from the voice industry started going, I've heard this story before. In fact, <laughs> the way uh, Matt Buck posted about it on LinkedIn, he said, I've seen this movie before. It didn't end well. <laughs> so there's a lot of questions about this and it's kind of um concerning because you and i have been talking for months about how you know the a the the llm industry needs to learn lessons from the voice industry and it really sounds like open ai did not learn a single lesson yeah, it's, it seems like it's still kind of the the uh, the old app model that we had before. There's a store, you get an app, you pay right. for it, and you and you run it on their platform, and you have to run it on their platform and pay their prices. Yeah, you know, so they they've talked about how you know uh, you're still going to be using you you get to choose which LLM it runs with, but you're paying the price to run it on that LLM. And they charge you for things like storing you storing the user context information and storing the documents that are used as part of expanded knowledge. So they 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 kind of have you the same way Alexa had you in the earliest days. You know, you have to run on their platform, you have to pay their fees. And in return, they'll share you know, they'll share some revenue with you in ways that will be specified later. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. But we saw how this played out before. And, you know, I I want to know what's different that we think it will work this time. 
Well, one thing that's different, because I had been thinking about this, one thing that is different is, is that the store would be clickable or linkable directly from, I'm assuming, the application that's using it. So inside of ChatGPT, there would be a button to go to the store to click something, you'd click it and you could immediately run it. Well, Whereas on uh, voice assistants, the store was someplace completely different from the hardware device that you were using and it seemed disjunct and people some people didn't even know that there were what there skills was a store were. right well, yeah were, were skills built into alexa were skills from somebody else were they so, both were they so how here's you, how do you get one yeah so so here's kind of my feeling about it when um when they launched plugins and we'll talk about plugins in a minute when they launched plugins several months ago everyone was saying plugins are great this is exactly what I wanted Alexa to do. And that was, you know, as you're talking to, in this case, ChatGPT, you wanted to be able to do something that ChatGPT wasn't already trained on, but it would figure it out because it had these other plugins available to it. Right. They've taken a step back from that. They're, they've kind of deprecated plugins without deprecating plugins. And they say on the plugin page now, we encourage you to, you know, plugins are very similar to actions. We encourage you to make this an action instead. And the way you invoke the actions is through a GPT. And the way you invoke a GPT is not through chat GPT. You have to launch a GPT separately. Yeah, it's kind of like a personalized version of a GPT, you know, it, kind of, it, yeah. It's, it's an app. It's an app. Yeah. that runs on the OpenAI website, but it's an app. Unless there's a good discovery method, are people going to discover them? Yeah. Or are we going to get 10 big GPTs, and those are the ones that you know OpenAI talks about in their email every month, and those are the ones that are getting revenue? Yeah, and are they going to do the same thing that Alexa did, where you could have multiple things named the same exact name, and then you get confused. On... Right. Now, one thing I did notice is that each GPT does have its own unique URL. Okay. So I could, you know, I can create a link to it easily, but I can't embed it in my website. It still lives on OpenAI's site. Yeah, and that's the thing that I was thinking is, is that you know, websites or companies would want to have their own branded assistant, chatbot, whatever, on their on their pages, and it would know everything about their their content, and be able to be a frequently asked questions and answer it in the the style of the brand that you are, and you know all that good stuff. Right. Um, but if that's if that's not hostable, and then, you know it's, it's probably fairly you know easy to do in the con, you know in the future to be able to embed something there maybe. Um, who knows? Yeah, who knows? But that's that's kind of where I would see that where people would, where users would want it is like, hey, I'm on this website. I have right. a question. Well, so here's I the can, thing. I go to G the bot, right? You know, the, the equivalents that we see out there right now, you know, the stuff with voice flow, the stuff with dialogue yeah. flow and Vertex AI search, all of those can be embedded on your own site. Yeah. And the similar, you know, they're not all that different from what a GPT is offering today. There are differences, but they're not that different. I'm I'm I'm, I'm dubious, I'll be honest. <laughs> I have I have, you know, and there's still questions about, you know, what about context? What about user context? What about privacy? What about information sharing? How much information am I getting about each thread? Yeah. That it, you know, who or how much information to... am I getting about each user? Because right. like, if if I if I if, would I want to know more about my customers to help better cater to them? Right. Um. Yeah. Some of that's not. Some of it is clear. It does sound like there needs to be, um, active, uh, authorization. Yeah. But it's not clear how often there needs to be active authorization or how it's granted or what it's tied to. You know there. There's still some things that seem fuzzy to me on that. I still have a lot more questions than I have answers right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, right now, but that's the way I, um, I see and, it too. And I'll be honest, I'm, you know, if OpenAI is saying we're making a platform, 
there's a lot more that has to come with this platform. You know, it's nice to be able to show a picture. That's a good start. The web did that a while ago. We're way beyond that right now. Way, way beyond that. And if they're not going to be, you know, they need and they need to support everything that an app or the web can do these days. And that's a lot. Yes. And that goes beyond their core competency of AI. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see where things where you know we forget this is just you know we began the year and we were talking yeah yeah GPT and now th towards the end of the year we're talking all about GPT and a lot's happened in this year, um, but there are some decisions that are being made now that are really going to impact the direction that this goes and and ultimately how successful it, you know it is. Sam Allman said. And what this is one of his closing lines was, you know, a year from now, everything that we're talking about right now is going to seem quaint. Yeah. And that's true. But I also look at everything that we talked about today and I'm like, well, that's all pretty quaint too. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this really isn't what people, people, people want to be two or three years down the road. We're already picturing that. Yeah. Telling us this is what we get now. Yeah, that's nice. Okay. <laughs> um so real quickly wrapping up uh you know so what happened to plugins they're deprecated they're on their way out uh which is interesting that's a technology that only lasted what six months now uh so so and they're already deprecated um and i didn't even do anything with them you know so i can't even be blamed for this one uh <laughs> and you know, so the, the other thing is, so we talked about this, uh, this low code, no code tool, the GPTs. There's still the flip side of that, though, and that's that uh, something they're, they called the assistance API. Love the name. Yeah. And this is, in some ways, very similar to some technologies that we've been talking about. You know, some technologies in voice flow and dialogue flow. And that's, you know, you've got the server side state management, the conversation threads that are stateful. Right. And this gives you the API to do all of these things and put them into your web page, build them into a mobile app, do many of the things that the GPTs offer, you know, because it includes things like uh, the, the retrieval augmented generation that's built in. It includes the code interpreter. Um, so it, it gives you the ability to to use those and maybe tie it into the new text to speech and tie it into whisper and you know to to build those things uh, the way exactly the way you want to it gives you a little bit more control. Yeah, um, I, I, I for example, I saw a, a, a code sample in JavaScript was about thirty lines where you can you know grab content from your website, uh, add it through the assistance. Um, API and have a conversation with it. You know, something that um, you had to either do by by hand or one of the things that LangChain's been been working on solving. And so my question is now, you know, what's the competition between the assistance API and LangChain? I think it's a good question, and I think kind of what what some of the answer is going to be is you we're seeing the company behind LangChain starting to position themselves as the hosting platform. So you'll be able to run your, your Langchains there, but also in general that Langchain is the platform to build more sophisticated agents. You know, right now the assistant API is kind of limited in how it processes the knowledge base. It's got a built-in knowledge base, but that's out of your control. Yeah. Langchain says, okay, it's more in your control. You can chunk them in different ways. You can use different AI strategies to get better answers out. You can choose different LLMs to do input and output and tune them the way that exactly the way you want each one tuned right. instead of having one general tuning to it. So I think Langchain is going to position themselves as um Sure, that one's you know off the shelf, and that's good. That's fine for a generic 
or a very specific use right. case. You know, yeah. when you want to start creating something that uses these tools and uses all of these tools, then you need a library that can do that, and that's us. Okay. Or we know, for example, Google's going to release something like a GP, you know, the GPTs. Yeah. You know, so now, okay, which platform are you going to live on? And Langchain's going to say, you don't need to live on a platform. You need to live on your platform. And you need to use us to help you do that. I, I feel like that's where they're going to start positioning oh, That's themselves. interesting. Yeah, we'll have to we'll watch to see how that goes. But yeah. And I think that's a really compelling argument. Because yeah. once again, you know, it's it was it goes back to the arguments that people were making about skills and actions. We were utterly reliant on the platform. Yeah. Well, and 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 for example, you're like, oh, I've got to create an Alexa skill. Oh, they also want a Google action. I have to create something that's similar, but in some ways completely different. And that's kind of where Jovo stepped in and said, hey, you can write on the same framework and um, handle, you know, not only Alexa and Google, but web chat and all this other stuff on it. Um, so I, I could see um, Langchain kind of feeling that it's like, well, you, you need a, a, a bot that can can be used in lots of different purposes or, you know, lots of different uh, contexts. And you don't want to, you want to be able to host it yourself and you, right. you have that ability to well, do it. And I think, I think the other thing we're going to start seeing soon um, and we're already hearing hints about it, but I think we're going to see this a lot, building up a lot more next year, are the local LLMs. Yeah. Because people are, um, you know, uh, we're recording this in the evening on Wednesday. This morning, uh, OpenAI's service went down for about an hour. Hour, two hours, about that. Um, so that was, you know, made a lot of people go, oh, hey, I'm relying on this platform for a lot. And I'm paying. And right? I'm paying. <laughs> Maybe I should think about other ways of doing this. Yeah. Um, so I think you're going to see more local LLMs. And as you do, you're going to need something that can orchestrate the various components of it. And that will be, you know, Langchain or something similar. Okay. Um, so, well, that was a lot, and I think we covered that in longer than it took them to initially present it at the keynote. But that's okay because I think we went into, I think we started asking the questions that they did not answer. Yes. And we'll be we'll be seeing how they answer them over time. You know, I've seen people say that they felt like to you know this was a very rushed release, that there are a lot of questions that were unanswered. Um, and that they're doing it because they're they're getting pressure from, you know, a certain other company uh, who may be releasing something soon. <laughs> um, and we'll see. So we'll see where it goes. But, you know, as a developer, as a voice developer, yep. I am both excited and concerned. You know, I, I, I think we have lessons that I hope somebody listens to. Yeah, that definitely pays attention to to you know what went well and what didn't go so well, and being able to create opportunities so that developers can be successful. Yep. No, that's it. Absolutely. Um, do you have any final thoughts? No, I'm just. Uh, it was uh, you know kind of crazy, um, just how much they were you know going through things and just a lot of different announcements and. And it's been it's been fun to see over the next few, you know the last few days as as things have rolled out what things are people are talking about which are seems to be more around the the GPTs, um, and and you know kind of what they're they haven't been talking about which is you know right now that like the text to speech stuff not yeah. so much. So, you know, we would love to hear what people's takes are. There's tons and tons of conversation going on on LinkedIn, so I especially encourage you to join us there. Yep. But we're on all the social networks. Leave your comments below, message us directly, you know, and we will certainly be talking about this some more on Two Voice Devs. Two Voice Devs. Take care, Alan. Take care, Mark. Hope we get some sleep soon. Yeah, <laughs> thanks.